from around the globe, it's theCUBE, with digital coverage of AWS reInvent 2020, sponsored by Intel, AWS, and our community partners. All right, you're continuing, or we're continuing around the clock coverage and around the world coverage of AWS reInvent 2020 virtual conference this year. Uh, I'm guessing hundreds of thousands of folks are tuning in for coverage and we're, have, we have on the other end of the country, a CUBE alum, Stephen Tao, co-founder and CTO of Amuta. Stephen, welcome back to the show. Uh, great, great to be here. Thanks for having me again. I hope to match your enthusiasm. <laughs> you know what, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, you're a co-founder, I'm sure you can match the enthusiasm. <laughs> Plus we're talking about data governance. You, you've been on the queue before and you kind of laid the foundation for us last year talking about challenges around data access and data access control. I wanted to extend this conversation I had a conversation with a CDO, Chief Data Officer, a couple of years ago, and he shared how his data analysts, his, the people that actually take the data and make business decisions or create outcomes to make business decisions, spent 80% of their time wrangling the data, just doing transformations. How is Muta helping solve that problem? Yeah, great question. So. It's actually interesting. We're seeing a division of roles in these organizations where um, we have um, data engineering teams that are actually managing a lot of the prep work that goes into exposing data and releasing data to analysts. Uh, and as part of their day-to-day -day job is to ensure that that data that they're releasing to the analysts is what they're allowed to see. Um, and so we kind of see this, this problem of compliance getting in the way of analysts doing their own transformations. So it would be great if we didn't have to have it limited to just this small data engineering team to release the data. But we believe one of the real issues behind that is that um, they are the ones that are trusted. They're the only ones that can see all the data in the clear. So it needs to be a very small subset of humans, so to speak, that can do this transformation work and release it. And that means that the data analysts downstream are hamstrung to a certain extent and, and bottlenecked by requesting these data engineers do some of this transformation work for them. Um, so I think because, as you said, that's so critical to being able to analyze data, um, that bottleneck could, could be a backbreaker for organizations. So we really think that to you need to tie transformation with compliance in order to streamline your analytics in your organization. So that has me curious, what does that actually look like? Because when, because when I think of a data analyst, they're not always thinking about, well, who should have this data? They're trying to get the answer to the question to provide to the data engineer. What does that functionally look like when, that, when you want to see that relationship of collaboration? Yeah, so, we, I think the beauty of Immuta and, and the beauty of governance solutions done right is that they should be invisible to the downstream analysts to a certain extent. So the, the data engineering team will take on some requirements from their legal and compliance team, such as you need to mask PII, or you need to hide these kinds of rows from these kinds of analysts, depending on what the user is doing. And we've just seen an explosion of different slices or different ways you should dice up your data and what who's allowed to see what, and not just about who they are, but what they're doing. Um, and so you can kind of bake all these policies up front on your data uh, in a tool like Immuta, and it will dynamically react based on who the analyst is and what they're doing to ensure that the right policies are being enforced. And we can do that in a way that when the analysts, I mean, what we also see is just setting your policies on your data once up front, that's not the end of the story. Like you, a lot of people will tap themselves on the back and say, hey, look, We've got all our data protected appropriately, job done. And that's not really the case because the analysts will start creating their own data products and they want to share that with other analysts. And so when you think about this, this becomes a very complex problem of, okay, before someone can share their data with anyone else, we need to understand what they were allowed to see. Um, so being able to control kind of this downstream flow of, of transformations and feature engineering to ensure that 
only the right people are seeing the things that they're allowed to see, but still enabling analytics is really the challenges that that we saw that Immuta to, you know, help the the data teams create those initial policies at scale, but also help the analytical teams build derivative data products in a way that doesn't uh, introduce data leaks. So as I think about the traditional ways in which we do this, we kind of, you know, take a data set, let's say it's a database, and we set security rules, et cetera, on those data sets. What you're hinting to is more of dynamic. How's Immuta approaching this problem from just a, a architectural direction? Yeah, great question. So I'm sure you've probably heard the term role-based access control. Um, and it, it's been around forever where you basically aggregate your users into roles and then you build rules around those roles. Um, and pretty much every legacy RDBMS manages data access this way. Um, what we're seeing now, and I, I call it the private data era that we're, we're now embarking on or have been embarking on for the past three years or so, where consumers are more aware of their data privacy and the needs they have there. There's, you know, data regulations coming fast and furious with no end in sight. Um, we believe that this role-based access control paradigm is just broken. We've got customers with thousands of roles that they're trying to manage to, to, to you know, slice up the data all the different ways that they need to. So instead, we, we offer an attribute-based access control solution and also policy-based access control solution, where instead it's really about how do you dynamically enforce policy by separating who the user is from the policy that needs to be enforced and, and, and having that execute at runtime. A good analogy to this is role-based access control is like writing code without being able to use variables. You're writing the same block of code over and over again with slight changes based on the role, where attribute-based access control is you're able to use variables and basically the policy gets decided at runtime based on who the user is and what they're doing. So that dynamic nature kind of lends itself to the public cloud. Where are you seeing this applied in the world of AWS? We're here at reInvent, so how are customers using this with AWS? So it all comes down to scalability. So the, the same reasons that you uh, separate storage from compute, you know, you get your storage in one place, you can ephemerally spin up compute like EMR if you want. Um, you can use Athena against your storage in a serverless way. That, that kind of um, freedom to choose whatever compute you want um, the same kind of concepts apply with policy enforcement. You want to separate your policy from your platform, and that this private data era has has you know created this need. Just like you had to separate your compute from storage in the big data era, and this allows you to have a single plane of glass to enforce policy consistently, no matter what compute you're using or what AWS resources you're using. Um, and so this gives our customers power to not only um, you know, build the rules that they need to build and not have to do it uniquely per service in AWS, but also prove to their legal and compliance teams that they're doing it correctly. Because um, when, when you do it this way, it really simplifies everything and you have one place to go to understand how policy is being enforced. And this really gives you the auditing and reporting around um, the enforcement that you've been doing to put everyone at ease that everything's being done correctly and that your data consumers can understand, you know, how your data is being protected, their data is being protected. Um, and you can actually answer those questions when they come at you. So let's put this idea to the test a little bit. So I have the data engineer who kind of designs the security policy around the data or implements that policy using Immuta uh, as dictated by the security and, and, and chief data officer of the organization. Then I have the analyst and the analyst is just using the tools that, at their disposal. Let's say that one analyst wants to use AWS Lambda and another analyst wants to use R type database or analysis tools. You're telling me that Immuta allows the flexibility for that analyst to use either tool within AWS? That's right, because we enforce policy at the data layer. Uh, so if you think about Immuta, it's really three layers, policy authoring, which you touched on, where those requirements get turned into real policies. Policy decisioning, so at query time, we see who the user is, what they're doing, and what policy's been defined to dynamically build that policy at runtime. 
And then enforcement, which is what you're getting at, the enforcement happens at the data layer. For example, we can enforce policies natively in Spark. So no matter how you're connecting to Spark, that policy is going to get enforced appropriately. So we don't really care about what the client tool is because the enforcement is happening at the data um, or the compute layer is, is, a, is a more accurate way to, to, to say it. So a practical reality of collaboration, especially around large data sets, is the ability to share data across organizations. How is Immuta hoping to just make that barrier a little lower, but ensuring security so that when I'm sharing data with uh, an analyst within another firm, they're only seeing the data that they need to see, but we can effectively collaborate on those pieces of content. Yeah, I'm glad you asked this. I mean, this is like the, um, you know, the, the big finale, right? Like the, the, this is what you get when you have this granularity on your own data ecosystem. It enables you to have that granularity now when you want to share outside of your internal ecosystem. And so I think an important part about this is that when you think about governance, you can't necessarily have one God user, so to speak, that ha has control over all tables and all policies. And you really need segmentation of duty where different parts of the org can hook in their own data, build their own policies in a way where people can't step on each other. And then this can expand this out to third party data sharing where you can set different anonymization levels on your data when you're sharing an external to the organization uh, versus if it's internal users and then someone else in your org could share their data with you and then that also to that third party. So it really enables and frees these organizations to share with each other in ways that weren't possible before because it happens at the data layer. Um, these organizations can choose their own compute and still have the same policies be enforced. And it, again, going back to that consistency um, piece, um, it provides, think of it as um, almost a authoritative way to share data in your organization. It doesn't have to be ad hoc. Oh, I have to share with this group over here. How should I do it? What policy should I enforce? There's this single authoritative way to set policy and share your data. So the first thing that comes to my mind, especially when we give more power to the users is when the auditors come and they say, you know what, Keith, I understand this is the policy, but prove it. How do we provide auditors with the evidence that, you know, the we're implementing the policy that we designed and then two, we're able to audit that policy. Yeah, good question. So um, I briefly spoke about this a little bit, but the when you author and define the policies in Immuta, they're immediately being enforced. So when you write something in our platform, um, it's, it's not a glorified Wikipedia, right? It's actually turning those policies on and enforcing it at the data layer. And because of that, any query that's coming through Immuta is going to be audited. But I think even more importantly, to be honest, we keep a history of how policy change is happening over time too. So you could understand, you know, so-and-so changed the policy on this table versus this other table, you know, got newly added and these people got dropped from it. So you get this rich history of not only who's touching what data and what data is important, but you're also getting a rich his history of, okay, how have we been treating this data from a policy perspective over time? How is it, like, what were my risk levels over the past year with, with these six tables? Um, and you can, you can answer those kinds of questions as well. And then we're in the era of cloud. We expect to be able to consume these services via API, uh, via a pay-as-you-go type of thing. How is your relationship with AWS and how, in the and ultimately the customer? How do I consume Immuta? Yeah, so um, Immuta can pretty much be deployed anywhere. So obviously, we're talking AWS here. Um, we have a SaaS offering where you can spin up Immuta a free trial and just be off and running, building policies and hooking up, hooking our policy uh, enforcement engine into your compute. Um, that runs in our, um, you know, infrastructure. There's also a deployment model where you deploy Immuta into your VPC. Um, so it can run on your infrastructure behind your firewalls. Uh, and, we, and, and we do not require any public internet access at all for that to run. We don't do any kind of phone homing because we're obviously a privacy company. We take this very sim seriously internally as well. 
We also have on-premise deployments, um, again, with, with zero connectivity, air-gapped environments. Uh, so, so we offer that kind of flexibility to our customers um, wherever they want Immuta to, to be deployed. An important thing to remember there too is Immuta does not actually store any data. We just store metadata and policy information. Um, so it's, that also provides the customer some flexibility where if they want to use our SaaS, they can simply build policy in there and then the data still lives in their account. We're just kind of pushing policy down into that uh, dynamically. So Steven Tao, co-founder, CTO of Immuta. I don't think you had to worry about matching my energy level. Uh, I threw some pretty <laughs> tough questions at, at you and you were ready there with all the answers. You want to see more interesting conversations from around the world with founders, builders. AWS reInvent is all about builders and we're talking to the builders throughout this show. Visit us on the web the cube, you can engage with us on Twitter. Talk to you next episode of the cube from AWS reInvent 2020.